Welcome to the Gate World Podcast. It's episode number 156 of the Gate World Podcast. Wow, you made it all the way to 156. My name is Darren. And I'm Adam. And this is the show where two nerds talk about Stargate. It's a big show this week. We've got a lot of things to talk about in this installment of the podcast. Because there's a ton of Stargate anniversaries going on. Uh, 2019 is a huge year for Stargate anniversaries. We had, back in January, remember, we celebrated the, let's see, it was the 10th anniversary of the end of Stargate Atlantis in 2009. And then in July, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of the premiere of Stargate Atlantis. Uh, But now in October, there's lots of anniversaries packed together. Stargate Universe just celebrated 10 years since its premiere. Gate World itself is about to celebrate its 20th anniversary. And of course, Stargate in general. Stargate as a, a universe, the original Stargate feature film, hit theaters 25 years ago this month. Yeah, wow. I mean, this this month is not just a, a celebration of Stargate, but a realization that time is a freight train and we're all passengers. I cannot believe how much time has passed because I, I wasn't there for the original Stargate film uh, or even Gate World's Genesis, but I was there for the end of Atlantis and I was there for the, for the beginning of Stargate Universe. And I mean, it's it's crazy to think that was a decade ago. It's huge, and I can't believe that uh, we've, I mean, we've come so far. This has been, like, most of my adult life has been following Stargate, tracking Stargate, reporting on Stargate for Gate World. I was in high school when the movie came out. Uh, I was in college when the TV show started, when SG-1 started. Uh, And then Gate World started in 1999. This was uh, 20 years ago. October the 22nd is our anniversary, and I've told this story a number of times, but the site started the night that Joel and R's Memories premiered on Showtime, uh, that mid-season three cliffhanger that has Apophis revealed at the end of it, Apophis alive again, uh, that was that was the night that the site started. Wow! So you you remember how much did how much time did you need in the lead up to construct the site and and get the gears turning before you published? I was kind of an HTML uh, junkie, uh, kind of a webhead back in the in the late 90s so i kind of had the wherewithal i already had server space Uh, i kind of knew what i was doing and so that night i assembled some quick and dirty html pages and and put them up online and uh it it took a while i think before i even registered a domain name Uh, and then gateworld eventually came along uh, as the site's name it wasn't even gate world right away right it was called uh, <laughs> what was it oh it was called star guide star guide and i would have been 4 when that came out so i can't help <laughs> but remem- remembering the original name that'll be up to you <laughs> all right well yes i'll be the i'll be the living memory repository of <laughs> gate world's history it's been a wild ride it's been a crazy 20 years and it's amazing to think about the fact that back when the site started in 1999 like a lot of the things that we take for granted about the internet today just didn't exist yet, right? This predates, of course, social media. Uh, Gate World is older than YouTube. Uh, streaming video online wasn't really a thing, right? We had tiny little low-res videos that you could get on the internet. But um, it was before blogs. It was before WordPress or any of these tools that would let you create a, a web presence on the fly. Wow. Yeah. I have a question just as it pertains to the original Stargate film. I'm sure you've shared this before on the podcast or on the site, but what was your experience watching that? Did you did you see it in theaters and, and did it capture you or was it the TV shows that really started to spark the passion for Stargate? Uh, the original film, let's see. I, I want to say I didn't see it in the theater. I, I have no memory of seeing Stargate in the theater, but I was a huge sci-fi fan. I was a huge Star Trek fan growing up, Star Trek and Star Wars, growing up as a kid in the 80s. Uh, I I must have caught it on video, but uh, I owned it on video, and so I wore it out. I watched it a million times, I'm sure. Uh, Because when when the news came around in 96, early 97, that they were going to do a TV show starring MacGyver on Showtime, uh, I was all in. I I was incredibly excited to see Stargate turned into a TV show. 
Yeah, and I feel like back then, with the you know, with the exception of a big franchise or a big established franchise like Star Trek, having a feature film spin off into a a well budgeted TV show um, that tackles such ambitious source material on a TV budget, you know, in the '90s, that was pretty rare and must have been pretty special at the time as well. Yeah, it was really a, an amazing thing, right? It feels if you go back and watch season one, it of course feels like that era. It feels like the late 90s, right? This was the era of Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Buffy uh, and other uh, sorts of shows like this. But it was a big Vancouver show, right? It was ambitious. They had a budget. And really remarkably, they had a two-season commitment up front from Showtime. And then uh, once they got going, I think maybe even before the show premiered in July of 97, they had a commitment for another two years. They had four years right off the bat. So we knew this was not a maybe 10 or 13 episode Firefly situation where the show might find success or might get canceled. We had four seasons coming right off the bat. We had a, a whole world to build. Historically speaking, do you know why the network had so much confidence or, or why there was so much commitment for essentially 40, 40 something hours of television right off the bat? Yeah, 44 episodes, 44 hours right off the bat. Uh, I th in part, I think, because they already had a working relationship with MGM and with the producers, Brad Wright and Jonathan Glasner, who created Stargate SG-1, were both writer-producers on The Outer Limits, right? Yeah, uh, which MGM was producing at the time for Showtime. So there was that working relationship, and then Showtime was, of course, like a lot of cable networks in the late 90s, they were just getting into original scripted programming. So they wanted to have new content that was theirs, that they could put their brand name on, uh, that they could, you know, carve out this, this sci-fi Friday night block. But we're actually not supposed to be talking about SG-1. We're supposed to be talking about uh, 10 years of Stargate Universe and 25 years of the Stargate feature film. So should we start with SGU? Let's do it. The main discussion. Okay, Adam, you are our resident SGU expert, or at least I'm dubbing you so for the purposes <laughs> of this discussion. Um, where do you want to start here? Well, let's start at the beginning. And, and the when I say beginning, I mean the literal beginning of the show, October 2nd of 2009, because I actually remember um, inviting over or, you know, more accurately forcing over all my high school friends. I'm like, there's this new show. We got to watch it. Um, I was completely on board the hype train. And, and I have such a fond memory of the lead up to Stargate Universe and, and knowing that this was going to be something fresh and new. And unlike Atlantis and SG-1, I was going to have been there from day one. See, I came into Stargate Atlantis about season three. I think maybe I saw season four as Adrift um, as the first live Stargate Atlantis episode I was watching. But this was something where I got it on the ground floor and I think it allowed me to connect with the production, with the characters and, and just not know where it was going to go. Like everybody else, you know, we were watching the episodes in real time. It's not like I had to catch up on all the box sets. And I think there was a certain energy that came with that, that I just have such an incredible, uh, memory with. Yeah. Those memories, premiere parties and stuff really stick out. The one that I remember, sort of my first get hyped moment for Stargate, <laughs> because right, you're waiting weeks and weeks and weeks and months yeah. until uh, a new season premieres was the start of season four of SG-1, right? Because the site started in the middle of season three. Of course, I was a, a big Stargate fan at that point, right? Big enough to start a site. But then there was this gap between the seasons. So I have vivid memories of the premiere of season four and where I was when I watched that. Uh, but with SGU, yeah, this was this was a new thing, right? A third Stargate show, a second spinoff. It was deliberately going to be different, sort of tonally, uh, different than the shows that had come before it. Right. And, and I actually think MGM and Sci-Fi did a really good job of providing a lot of content and insight in the lead up. Um, I, I think there was a, a conscious awareness on behalf of the studio and the network that this was going to be higher budget, higher risk. Um, it was going to be a little bit of a sell to fandom because it was going to be tonally different and and have different themes and different kinds of characters. And uh, Stargate Universe is also special for me because that's when I was really getting into filmmaking. That's kind of what inspired me to go down the film school route and get involved with media and narrative storytelling. So I, I almost had my first film school class watching Stargate Universe get made and watching the lead up to uh, the season one premiere. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I really enjoyed the show from the start. I think it's even grown on me since then, but, but I, I thought the first 10 episodes were just a, a wild ride already. Yeah. I was in Scotland when Stargate Universe premiered. We had just moved our family overseas for graduate studies. Um, but you know what? I, I got to see it early, of course, because, uh, running the site, I was able to get my hands on a screener from sci-fi. They put out, we've got photos of this on GateWorld. We'll link to it in the show notes at GateWorld.net. I took pictures of the screener that they made, and it's this really nice blue hardcover book with full-color glossy pages introducing the show and all the cast, and it has a little push button on the cover with a light-up, I think it's a light-up chevron, uh, and it came with the screener discs for Air Parts 1, 2, and 3, I think, I think all of air was on the on the screener. So I had that. Um, this is a, a prized possession in my Stargate collection now, of course. But uh, I had that, and I took it with me to Scotland. So we were able to watch the premiere, uh, I think, before we left town. Wow. So what were, what were your thoughts on the three-part premiere back in 2009? Let's just say, what was your first impression of it? Well, the producers really delivered on a show that was different. Yeah. Uh, of course, watching SG-1 and Atlantis for so many years, it's kind of first impression is that overlap of familiarity and difference. Right? It was the same world. It was the same Stargate. It was literally the same set, right? They redressed the SGC for Icarus Base and uh, same characters, right? Same actors, uh, RDA and uh, Amanda Tapping are in the, the premiere. Michael Shank shows up in, in uh, the, the videos that he does that Eli watches. Um, yeah, it was right, this familiar, but so different because it's, it's shot different and it's tonally different. Um, of course, by the time the crew gets to Destiny, uh, and uh, starts their the sort of difficulty of living on this ship together. Uh, that's when the show really starts to feel different. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like part of the sell of the Stargate uh, TV universe is the fact that it is so interconnected to a world that is something that we can all recognize. Uh, it's connected to a modern world. It's just happening behind this veil, you know, b- behind sh- the veil of Cheyenne Mountain Complex or hidden in the San Francisco Bay or however it ties into modern events. And that was cool. But this is something that, I mean, you have the ancient communication stones, but it has a frontier vibe in the sense that, you know, some of these other uh, swashbuckling space shows used to have. It doesn't feel like it's trying to too heavily connect us into the modern world. And, you know, it also did explore certain parts of characters that maybe were also explored in the other Stargate shows, but it took a much more uh, direct and, and, and uh, visceral approach and was a little more messy. Like, you know, we didn't always love our characters. And I think that was probably, I mean, even for me, that was an adjustment. I mean, because you know how much we all love Colonel Carter or John Shepard, Jack O'Neill, and, and these people are just simply not those characters. Of course, it, it was early on a source of controversy about the show. Not only that it was different, but that most of the characters were not particularly likable, at least at first, right? And part of the storyline moving through the first season and well into the second season, for example, is that Colonel Young is not good at his job. He, right, we get this, this, uh, the way that he handles the Lucian Alliance incursion at the end of season one, Uh, the, the, the way that destiny puts him to the test in trial and error in season two. Uh, These are uh, sort of, demonstrating the fact that he's not this cookie cutter square jawed hero uh, who's who's going to sort of step up and save the day right he eventually gets to the point after trial and error where he has to step up and be the commander that he can be right and realize his potential but it took a long time for that character to get there yeah, I remember there was a moment early on in season one where he uh, was in General O'Neill's office via the communication stones, and O'Neill literally says, are you up for this? Because I can get someone to replace you if you're not, and you know maybe I should be there myself if you can't step up. And I think 
Uh, that kind of rattles him, but it also sets up from early on that Colonel Young is doubting himself. The command structure of Homeworld Command is doubting him, and he goes to very dark places in the show, specifically, you know, as far as murdering his enemy, Rush. What I did love about Colonel Young was almost how empathetic he was, and not everyone will agree with me on that, but he is a deeply broken and flawed person, but someone who I, I think they gave enough... Uh, background and character to that I could understand why he was screwing up and that made me kind of want to see him get a second chance if that makes sense yeah you know what was most different for me coming into that show uh, as the third Stargate series was uh, SG-1 and Atlantis as well but especially SG-1 being a show that was born in the 1990s was really episodic yeah remember especially in those early seasons was a, a really self-contained hour-long story. And what I loved, right, one of the reasons why I started a website to sort of track the mythology of this of this world was that there would be references to past episodes. There would be story arcs that would move the ball forward, right? Our relationship with the Tok'ra, et cetera. Um, but SG-1 was a really episodic show. When we got to SGU, it was very deliberately not. Yeah. So right, you might get a, a self-contained story like, hey, uh, we need drinking water. We found an ice planet. We're going to go there and try and harvest as much ice as we can before the ship jumps. But SGU is a show of its own time, premiering in 2009. So it's it's very arc-based. And I think that fits the, the tone of the show really well because it, it forces you as the viewer now to sort of be on the destiny with the rest of the crew. It's not a show that you can necessarily pop in and pop out of, right? Just sort of enjoy it for 44 minutes. And I feel I feel like the show was also ahead of its time in a way, and not just in terms of like the way the stories were told, but just in terms of its format. Because uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, that's the genesis of where the first streaming services started to develop and where serialized viewing, like with, you know, Netflix launching House of Cards, I think in 2013, and, you know, th that model taking off. Um, I, I feel like SG would have been really suited to that because of the serialized nature and, you know, having the first 10 episodes be so character-based and all be a week apart and be, you know, slow in pace when watched with commercials and a week-long break. And then, of course, after the cliffhanger uh, season season 1.0 cliffhanger justice, you have to wait, I think it was like five months until spring just to see the resolution. Um, yeah. You know, there are many theories as to why the show lost viewership and uh, one of which, you know, I think a lot of people push, which is that people didn't like the show, which is definitely fair. I still think the format and the delivery method was flawed for this kind of story and did result in kind of, a, uh, you know, having the audience drop off a little bit. Well, I've made my opinion known on this podcast before. I, th I think that Space, the episode, episode 11 was the, the mid-season premiere. Yeah. It was originally slated to be the mid-season finale, that, the last one in that first batch. And, and I think that the show would have gotten off to a stronger start if it had compressed some of the storytelling in the early going and had space be that first note that it went out on, right? The encounter with aliens and all right, there's this new threat to the ship and the sort of right, the forcing characters now to work together, Rush and, and Chloe in the water tanks. That's visually incredible. I wish that that had been the first note that the show went out on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has been nice, I will say, uh, to see that over time fans have embrace the show more as a whole and, and something that uh, is watched not in the context of how we feel in 2009 or how we feel about Atlantis, but how we feel about this story as a whole, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, some people have come around to it, some people who never gave it a chance to finally watch it, and I think there were so many strong emotions in Stargate fandom, you know, circa 2009. I remember it because we were supposed to get an Atlantis movie, that kept getting delayed. SG-1 was supposed to have a third movie that was, like, guaranteed, you know, it's been greenlit, we're in pre-production, and then that fell apart. Right, right. There was still kind of a, a regret or a bitterness that Atlantis didn't get to run concurrently with Stargate Universe for a sixth season, and I've, I've found that with franchises that have a history and have a fan that have a very personal relationship when you're at a certain point in time and something comes along that you're not ready for or you don't want or you feel is jarring you know your emotions are a bit distorted i had that myself yeah i just am very appreciative now hashtag not my stargate yeah, yeah exactly i'm just appreciative now that 
there is that distance. I feel comfortable recommending the show now and not having to apologize for it and saying, look, you know, whatever we felt about SG-1 or Atlantis or however weird it was when the show came out, like, just try the show now. You know, try it on streaming or the DVDs and, and, and give it a chance. And maybe it's not your thing. Like, I really don't mean to sound critical of people who don't connect with this. I totally understand why. Um, but now I feel like 10 years later, we can kind of look at the two seasons for what they are. Yeah, I think that's right. It's It really is a show that benefits from uh, an extended binge viewing experience yeah. as opposed to the weekly. Now I got to wait another week, right? When you binge watch a show, uh, I think you're more forgiving because it's easy to sort of burn past things that you don't like, right? If you're watching three or four in a day and move on to the next story point, uh, it's right. Since we've been publishing Sarah Kehoe's uh, SGU sort of marathon that she's been doing uh, as someone who didn't watch the show when it was on television, but now uh, as a longtime Stargate fan who's gone back and watched through these two seasons, uh, you're going to have her back on the podcast here really soon to talk about season two. Yeah. But um, it's reminded me that right, the show, uh, the show benefits the way that the story is told really benefits from that format of viewing. So I think that its legacy really is, I think it's just going to going to be more discovered and more appreciated uh, now that it's available on streaming and on DVD, etc. But that's still no Blu-ray. What's going on, MGM? Man, yeah, no, I really wish we had that. Give me some Blu-rays. You know, it's funny because uh, I just moved into a new place uh, early on in summer, and uh, the two guys I live with both are industry people, so we've put up movie posters everywhere. And I was able to sneak a Stargate Universe poster in there, thinking either no one would care or I'd get ridiculed for it at some point, because I'm <laughs> kind of used to being ridiculed for as a Stargate fan or a Stargate Universe fan specifically. Mm -hmm. And I have had two or three people people who are friends, you know, friends of my friends who have come in and been like, oh my God, I love that show. I've never seen a poster of that before. And they talk all about how they discovered it on streaming or how they were watching or, or you know, their relationship with Stargate. Usually people on the younger side, like guys or girls in their twenties. And nice. uh, each time I'm like, where were you 10 years ago? We could, we needed yeah, we you. We needed but... you to keep the show on the air. <laughs> but what's nice is like, I've never expected to see the legacy be so pervasive. Um, it feels like people are still discovering it. It feels like people who didn't enjoy it will rewatch it now and, and have a relationship with it. And I mean, I think that uh, speaks to the quality or the success of the endeavor, however limited, the fact that people will still point out that poster and want to engage in a discussion and share that they, they do really appreciate the show and, and what it did for its short duration. Yeah. Well, really what we ended up with uh, after two seasons is a uh, what was projected to be a five-year story yeah. that was not told. Uh, we got 40% of that story. Uh, and we have had some hints from the producers over the years as to uh, uh, bits and pieces of what might have been coming, at least in terms of resolving the, the cliffhanger of Gauntlet. When we marked 10 years of Stargate Universe on GateWorld.net uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I put up an article on 10 unanswered questions that the show left us with. Now, we can look at other media to try and answer some of these questions, right? There's a, an SGU continuation in comic book format. Uh, but we still have lots of, of questions that, boy, I'd sure love a, a Brad Wright or a Rob Cooper to tell us someday where this show was going, right, to answer some of these mysteries for us. Because the comic books, as terrific as they were, uh, they're not based on the, the notes from the producers. They're, they're the, yeah. what, the, what the authors of the comics uh, imagined would happen next. I think what stings the most is the fact that we know for a fact that Brad and Rob had very specific answers to some of these questions. And so it's not so much that... We, we could have an end goal, you know, could go for 10 seasons or could go for four seasons. It's like, no, there was there was something um, very ambitious and very thematically rich that was being developed with the cosmic microwave background radiation and the purpose of destiny and the, the characters accepting their fate. Um, you know, instead of being passengers, they step up and become stewards of the destiny and, and its journey. And there was something poetic and, and timeless about the story and... I just want to know what happens. I mean, I, I've come to peace with the fact that we'll probably never get a continuation movie or or a revival. Uh, but there is, I think, above all, of all the questions that could be answered, and, and there are many that were unanswered, just the purpose of Destiny and, and what 
what is behind the cosmic microwave background radiation? Were we ever going to find out? Was there going to be some massive existential revelation about reality that yeah. the show was going to try and tackle? Um, something that even Neil deGrasse Tyson would get on board with, you know, that kind of <laughs> level. Um, I, I, gosh, I want to know. From what the producers have said, they had a beginning, a middle, and an end in mind when they started writing the story. This is not a sort of episodic story where they were figuring it out as they went along. That's that, that's where some serialized shows, uh, like perhaps Lost, faltered a bit. Or Battlestar Galactica, right? Battlestar Galactica uh, opened every episode with, uh, and they have a plan. <laughs> and the producers made it uh, known by the end of the series that there was not a plan, at least not from the beginning. They found the plan as they wrote the show. They they discovered what the plan was by the time they got to the end of the series. Uh, but not so with Stargate Universe. Uh, and it's amazing to me that it took us, right, what, 27 episodes out of 40. 27 episodes before we even heard any talk of cosmic microwave background radiation before we even got that glimpse into why it was that the ancients launched Destiny so long ago. So there's the big picture questions about Destiny's mission, and of course the immediate questions of, uh, uh, does the crew survive, right? Does Eli survive? Did he manage to fix the pod? Are we going to wake up? Is it going to be one year later or 500 years later when we wake up from stasis? But in addition to that, the immediacy of the cliffhanger and the big picture stuff of Destiny's mission, the one question that I really want answered, that I'd really like to know more about, is who built the obelisk <laughs> on the Eden planet? Yeah. Right? We discovered this planet uh, not only with this giant obelisk sort of uh, statue structure on the surface, but there's every indication that uh, whoever built that also probably built the planet and maybe the star system. So the most advanced species that we've ever had any sort of hint about in the Stargate universe. Yeah, when I was writing the What to Find Stargate article earlier this year, I was trying to find what um, could link Stargate Universe, which is exploring all these dark corners of the universe, to something like SG-1 or Atlantis, which is so integrated with Earth-based mythology. And I really think there is this overall existentialism that uh, is pervasive through all three shows, and, and the characters of Earth are discovering as they learn about the four great races, as they learn about the Wraith, as they learn about the Replicators. They're just expanding their understanding of why we exist and, and how the cosmos works. And, uh, you know, early on, it was very much Egyptian mythology is not what you think. You know, Nordic mythology is not what you think. Here's what it's actually like in the world of Stargate. But I felt like the, whatever we learned about the obelisk or the planet builders or the ancients or whatever destiny was chasing down, that was going to paint a complete picture of what uh, you know, the Stargate TV versus take on reality and humanity was. It would have been the bow on top of this this massive edifice that Stargate was building. And that, I, I you know, I do think actually the, the planet builders might have tied into the cosmic microwave background radiation. I think yeah. there was such an emphasis placed on that arc between, you know, with Faith and then with TJ's uh, visions and intervention and then with Visitation where uh, the dead crew members are reincarnated by an unknown entity. Yeah. Just not very well. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Just temporarily reincarnated. But I don't think the show would spend so much time reinforcing that arc if it wasn't going to tie into some of the big reveals at the end. Um, I mean, what are your theories on it? Where do you think that was going? That seems really likely to me because we were left with these two giant questions. One is, is there an intelligence at the beginning of the universe? That's the question of the cosmic microwave background radiation. The other question is, who is this advanced species who can bring dead humans back, who can recreate our shuttle pristine uh, the day that it was made, and apparently make star systems? <laughs> so it's entirely plausible to me that those two questions might have the same answer. If there's a species out there that's advanced enough and old enough that they can make star systems... Uh, in a in a very short span of time, right? The the thesis that Rush puts forward in Faith is that uh, he thinks the star system was created recently because uh, there's no record of it when the seed ship passed by, right? So the 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 Stargate seed ship that is ahead of Destiny on its flight path recorded no planet here and no star here. 
Yeah. Uh, so he theorizes uh, somebody put it here since that ship went by. Uh, yeah, it's entirely plausible to me that that those are those two questions may have the same answer. So while there were a lot of unanswered questions um, and and stuff that I still dwell on often and and secretly hope we'll get a resolution to, I also feel like I have the relationship I do with Stargate Universe because of the episodes it delivered that worked as an hour of entertainment, as an hour of character-centric storytelling. So I want to ask you, what are some of the episodes that have really stuck with you over time? Maybe, you know, whether they were your favorite when it aired or not, what episodes now do you still think about and and really uh, feel passionately about? That's a great question. I think I probably think about moments more than I think about episodes oh, or, or stories, right? I, I, When I think about season two, for example, I often go back to Riley's death in Aftermath. Uh, Colonel Young had to, had to end his life uh, in order to right, get everybody else off the planet uh, and, and save TJ and others who might want to stay behind. Uh, so I think about moments like that, right? I think about Chloe sort of voluntarily handing herself over to the Nakai, the blue aliens. Yeah. What about you? Um, I, I definitely think the show, like you says, has standout moments and sequences that are, are kind of the most memorable parts. I do think there are a few episodes that stand out to me, um, over time. Also, as I've matured, like thinking back to when SGU premiered, I was like 15 years old and now I'm, uh, or 14, 15 years old. Now I'm 24. I think one's perspective on storytelling and on characterization changes a lot of the time. Like, for example, when I first watched Light, season one's Light, uh, episode, season one, episode five, I enjoyed it. But I think the the kind of the massive montages and, and the characters confronting their death, the the poetic nature of that and the emotional power of that was kind of lost on me. Yeah. You know, now, now that I'm older and I, I understand more about life and relationships and mortality, I think that's like a, a beautiful uh, a scene from an opera, just them descending into a star. It feels like something from a, a beautiful stage play. And I, I am, you know, just in awe of the performances and the cinematography and, and the music. I mean, Joel Goldsmith's music in this episode and honestly, the entire show is just spiritual. It's the final work he did before he passed away. It's the culmination of everything he learned in uh, scoring 15 seasons of previous Stargate. Um, light for me is something that I get chills thinking about. And whenever I watch it, it's a, a deeply spiritual experience. Yeah, it's it's slow and and sad. Right? These are characters who are sitting around waiting for their death. Right? They're, they're anticipating their death, not knowing that Destiny is going into the star on purpose to refuel. Uh, and then there's that incredible turn when the characters realize what the ship is doing, why it's doing it, and that they're going to be okay. And now they have to go rescue the people on the shuttle. It's interesting that what I think I take away from SGU is more of uh, the humanity and the massive emotions that come with the show. Like uh, like Faith is another episode I love because these characters are, are trying to figure out what the rest of their lives are going to look like. Um, whether they're going to stay on the planet and try to make a life there and just accept the fact that they will almost certainly never get home or have a horrible quality of life and continue to run into danger at every corner and stay on the destiny and hope that they're able to complete the mission or find a, a power source that they can dial back. Um, you, you know, it's these quiet moments. It's these character moments. It's as much as I, I am all here for Stargate's uh, battles and aliens. Like this, this show was able to craft something that was extremely resonant in a human sense. I feel like over time, I've been able to appreciate that more. And when I show yeah. Stargate Universe to new people, I feel like that's also what they latch onto. You know, because some of the visuals can become dated over time, but I feel like the the emotions, the, the, the core human emotions of exploration and survival and the relationships they form, that is timeless and that will continue to resonate. And I'm I'm still a big fan of the basic conceit of Stargate, right? The basic, the basic idea of the gate itself as an ancient artifact that connects worlds and now connects this ship that's galaxies and galaxies away from, from our own. Uh, so I go back, right, and I think of, of episodes like Lost in the first season of SGU where it's a gate problem, right? I love these episodes in SG-1 in Atlantis where there's a gate problem. Yeah. Uh, and with Lost, it's uh, the team's been separated from Destiny. Destiny is uh, now off in FTL. But of course, FTL is not terribly fast, and maybe we can catch up. 
So it's now this this challenge of of moving from gate to gate to gate, from world to world to world, trying to catch up with the ship before it gets out of range. Uh, that's a great example of what SGU did in telling stories that are distinctly Stargate stories, but also in new ways. Right? That's not a gate problem that could ever be told on Atlantis or on SG-1. It made the Stargate universe feel bigger to me. It made the show Stargate universe feel feel bigger, feel like it was on on the grand scale that it was it was aspiring to. Because, right, we see these quick glimpses of these planets. The team is hopping from planet to planet, and James and the search parties are hopping from planet to planet. And we're like, you know, Destiny in season one, especially, Destiny is a runaway freight train. And we don't have time to stop and explore any of these planets to see if any of them are populated or if they have resources or uh you know, this, that, and the other thing. We spent in, uh, on SG-1, because of the episodic nature of the series, we spent an hour on each planet. We spent a whole episode. The characters were often there for days or weeks. Uh, but here, it's just, right, you pop through the gate, you have a second to look around, and then you gotta go, because destiny is getting away. You know, it's interesting, I, I just realized this, um, you know, in past shows at SG-1 Atlantis, a lot of the narrative structure was built around having resolutions, you know? There were often scenes at the end where the team was able to go to the cabin or have dinner together or decompress or know that the threat had been neutralized, you know? Know that they solved the problem, know that they, fi they reached a scientific discovery or made a new ally. And because of that, you could start an episode and go on this giant waveform. It goes up and then it comes down. With Stargate Universe, there was just this ongoing like dread there was just this slow burn uh dread and desperation that's kind of what made the show always interesting to me it, it was never boring because there was this constant force behind the characters pushing them forward there was no chance to you know take a weekend retreat or or sit down in the general's office and talk things out about your feelings or your ideas it was like yeah gotta move on gotta keep going and that, that's a great metaphor for life as well because growing older i definitely feel like there's a destiny behind me just pushing me forward yeah and I don't have a chance to catch my breath sometimes. The most that you're going to get is maybe with the communication stones. Once once your turn comes up, maybe you're going to get a little bit of R&R &R and get to go to Earth for a few hours. But that's about it. So as we said, SGU ends up being, right, we're looking back on it, celebrating it 10 years after its premiere. But it ends up being a five-year story that we only saw two years of. So we've talked uh, quite a lot on the podcast and on Gateworld, obviously, about Gauntlet as, a, as an ending of the show, as a season finale that has to now function as a series finale, like it or not. So uh, let's just end there with this last episode. Is this, d does this feel like anything approaching a complete or a satisfying ending? Um, I think yes, but only in a sp very specific way. Um, in the fact that the episode really brings an emotional resolution to the show. Um, you know, a lot of what we talked about earlier, uh, the questions we want answered would be a narrative resolution, something you can explain and a, a fact, a truth about the planet builders, a truth about the microwave background radiation. Yeah, those questions getting answered. Yeah, yeah. No matter how you look at it, it's not a satisfying answer to those narrative questions. Um, but the show has always really been telling the story through the characters lenses and that's why we took 10 episodes uh, in season one to take things very slowly to get to know these people and what happens in Gauntlet, uh, the changes Eli goes through and you get the sense that his relationship has reached this point with Colonel Young and Dr. Rush and that everyone's working together and these characters are confronting an uncertain future, but doing it in a way that is so much more mature and and thoughtful and sophisticated than it was a year ago when they first boarded the ship. You just get the sense that as they drift off into the good night, they are changed people. And so much of what you wanted to see happen to them has happened to them. And in that sense, I can't think of a more stirring emotional resolution than to see these people have changed and drift off into an uncertain future, but but have that emotional catharsis that I think the episode poetically delivered. And I think that that was the point of the episode. Yeah. Um, definitely wasn't planned to be a series finale, but um, somehow it worked. And I think they're very lucky that they wrote the episode in such a with such a philosophical slant because that allowed some form of resolution to be given to the viewers, if not direct answers. Yeah, it's... It's not the finale we wanted. It's not the finale that the writers wanted, obviously. But I think you're exactly right. It it doesn't answer the mythology questions. It doesn't answer the plot questions. But it feels 
it still feels satisfying to me on an emotional level, right? Not a, not a, they lived happily ever after happy ending, but uh, looking at the characters and uh, where they've grown to the relationships that they have with one another. I think it's an emotionally fitting place to end. Yeah. I, I remember when the credits rolled, uh, when I, when I had watched it the night it came out, I just, <laughs> I just started crying mm. um, for, for quite a while because not only was it the end of the show that, taught me so much and, and instilled a kind of passion for storytelling and the arts in me, but it was, I knew it was the end of Stargate or at least this chapter of Stargate with, with, uh, these showrunners and these writers and, you know, looking at Gauntlet as the finale of kind of all three shows in a certain sense, because it is the last of the Wright Cooper era. I don't think no matter what revival we get, it won't be like having Joe Malozzi and Robert Cooper and Brad Wright in a room, you know, uh, writing these kinds of stories. It's just never Stargate will never be this way again. And realizing that and knowing how influential it was in my life and, and how treasured it was in my life, even though I was only there for a few years, it all hit me in one wave, you know, the yeah. end of the season, the end of the series, the end of the TV universe as we know it. And that's also why I think it works, because it's 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 haunting, but beautiful. Well, before we go, before we wrap up the podcast, I do want to talk uh, for a few more minutes about Stargate. Stargate, the feature film, came out in 1994. So on the one hand, we're celebrating 25 years of the feature film that was right, written and produced by Dean Devlin, uh, co-written and directed by Roland Emmerich, uh, but also we're celebrating 25 years of this world that the feature film created. So I, I would say, you know what, the film is a product of its era. It, uh, it wasn't well-received critically in 1994 when it came out on October 28th, uh, but it was received well by fans. Stargate ended up being the biggest uh, box office moneymaker for an October release. I think it set a record, actually, for an October release in 94. But it was, right, it's kind of the quintessential mid-90s action movie. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a precursor to Independence Day made by the same people. Um, it is, like you said, it is a blockbuster of its era, but at the same time, I revisited it like a year ago and I hadn't seen it uh, since like my childhood, I feel like, because I was so deeply invested in the TV universe and yeah. revisiting it, I was surprised just how well it works as a story. It just flows. It has momentum. It hooks you in. You, we don't get the same kind of deep uh, exposition that we get with SG-1. We don't learn all about Stargate Command. You know, sure. we have very, very brief interactions with Daniel Jackson and Catherine Langford. And I think for me, when, when I was younger, that turned me off. I was just like, oh, you know, why? In Stargate SG-1, I learned about all these things. Why is this just you know, rushing through, I, I can't link into anything, but like when you accept it as a two hour story, when you think, okay, this needs to be delivered, you need to introduce the world of Stargate. You need to introduce these characters. I just think the movie is so economical and so engaging and so much fun to watch, whether you can see the strings hanging from the death gliders or not, whatever, you know, whatever production flaws there are, uh, I, it really works. Um, and I think it's, you know, to this day, just a great way to kick off everything that was to come. I find this movie so watchable and so entertaining, right? There's tons of movies from the mid nineties that I, I can't really make myself go back and watch Sure. because right tonally or the visual effects or they're just cheesy, uh, Stargate, right? It maybe has a little cheese baked into it. Uh, give my regards to King Tut, <laughs> but, uh, it's so watchable. I still just love this movie so much. Um, it made, I've got the numbers here. It made $71.5 million at the U.S. box office and $196.5 million worldwide. Uh, in today's dollars, that is about $340 million, which is not too shabby. The production budget was $55 million. Most people today, right, if you follow the TV shows, if you follow Gate World, you're well aware, of course, that MGM owns the Stargate universe. A lot of people don't know that MGM was not involved in the production of Stargate. MGM came along kind of at the 11th hour and uh, struck a deal to release, to distribute the film in the United States. Yeah, and that's wild because Stargate is so synonymous with MGM, and I think it is still, to this day, one of their flagship franchises, uh, although it is dormant now. Um, it is such a big part of their library and their legacy. And, I, you know, I, I actually didn't know this until you told me before the call uh, that they came in after the fact. 
Yeah, I'm working on, I've been uh, deep in research in the archives for a long form piece on the history of Stargate and specifically the Stargate feature film. Uh, this is an article that's going to go up on gateworld.net on the anniversary. So just a few days on October the 28th, 2019, as we celebrate 25 years of the Stargate feature film. So I've been, I've learned stuff in this research that I didn't even know. Uh, I had no idea that, you remember the movie Cutthroat Island? Did you ever see that? I'm aware of it, but only vaguely. It's this uh, swashbuckling adventure movie from 1995 that starred Gina Davis and Matthew Modine. Uh, I had no idea that Cutthroat Island is, in a roundabout way, largely responsible for Stargate going to MGM. Really? And thereby vicariously, right, for MGM's decision to turn this into a television universe and give us the 17 seasons that we know and love. Uh, Cutthroat Island. One of the producers of the Stargate feature film was a company called Carol Co. Pictures. It was founded by one of the Stargate movie's executive producers, Mario Kassar. Uh, Carol Co. did lots of these kind of big budget tentpole movies that made a bunch of money, but they were always kind of teetering on the, the financial edge. So Cutthroat Island uh, was going to be kind of the movie that, that saved them from bankruptcy. So they take a bunch of the money that they made from Stargate, they put it into Cutthroat Island, and this is a big piece of why they let Stargate go to MGM. This was part of Carol Co.'s last-ditch effort to save the company. Cutthroat Island notoriously is one of the biggest bombs in film history, <laughs> uh, at least in the 1990s. Uh, it was a catastrophe. Carol Co. went out of business, and the end of the story that uh, I'm telling in this article is uh, Stargate ends up in the hands of MGM and we get the television universe. And I think we're all deeply grateful for that. Um, I, I know there's kind of some questioning as to why, if the television universe was so successful, things haven't been kicked back into gear. Um, but, you know, just kind of like topping out, I feel like what our thesis statement for the universe discussion was, which is that the 17 seasons really just work as their own big long chapter, you know, three volumes in a big book. And, and you know, we wouldn't have got that without them going bankrupt without the catastrophe that you just explained. So I'm in, in a weird way grateful for it. Yeah, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Uh, both the, the in-universe history, right? the story of the Stargate, its discovery, it's it's uh, the launch of Stargate Command and going to Abydos, and then the real world history of how this picture came to be, right? This was largely uh, independently financed. Devlin and Emmerich kind of uh, screwed scrapped together enough money to get their movie made and distributed. Uh, and eventually it ends up in the hands of MGM. And and right, this is a, a big piece of the history of Stargate. The legacy of Stargate is that the people who created it, the original uh, creators of the idea, uh, lost control of it. Yeah. Kind of pretty quickly, right? Right off the bat, they wanted to make a trilogy of feature films. And MGM decided by uh, 1996 that they were going to go TV instead. They were going to take it to Showtime. Yeah, I think Devlin and Emmerich always wanted to do two trilogies for their properties, one of which would, was Stargate and the other of which is Independence Day. And they kind of sn snuck a second Independence Day movie in there, but uh, Stargate was so violently ripped from their hands that they would have had to reboot it if they were going to uh, realize their original vision. And I think, you know, for a couple of years that was in development, um, ultimately that got struck down in favor of, of sticking with the TV canon, I believe. Uh, I mean, you have any more information you can provide on that front? Well, yeah, we learned in uh, 2014 that MGM had agreed to do a new film trilogy. And uh, Dean Devlin, Roland Emmerich uh, were going to write and, and produce and direct again. And like you said, they, they were going to have to reboot it uh, and kind of start the story over. Uh, they hired writers. I don't know if there was a finished script if anybody out there has a, a finished script for this movie, uh, <laughs> I would love to receive an anonymous email uh, in my inbox. Uh, I'd love to see it. But uh, yeah, it was it was sort of just sort of languishing in development for a couple years. And by the fall of 2016, uh, MGM made it clear that this movie was not going to get made. Yeah. And in some sense, I, I, I know I had fears about whether it would erase the TV canon because Devlin and Emmerich were very much set on telling their trilogy and to do that it would have either needed to create a 
Kelvin timeline like situation, like what JJ Abrams did with Star Trek, or yeah. essentially say, you know, that's now legends. The TV show is now legends. Um, I don't think there's any malice um, that Devlin and Emmerich have towards the TV universe, just rather a, a dedicated passion to tell their story. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I was so glad when, you know, I hate to say this, but I was so glad at the time when that project died because it seemed like, you know, moving into Stargate Origins or, or moving on to whatever MGM was developing. Developing, that was going to be a continuation of the TV universe. So, you know, I was very happy that 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 project didn't come to life. But at the same time, now that I look back, you know, go, revisiting the original movie and seeing how much I love that and seeing all that it was planting and, you know, wondering what could have been, I, I kind of wish we could have seen uh, their trilogy told in the parallel timeline. If there was any way to establish that, I'm actually very curious because so much of what we love about SG-1 was inspired by the original movie. Yeah. There are these sort of parallel canons because even the TV show, when Children of the Gods premiered, it was it was kind of a different universe, right? There were just enough in-story changes to what the film had set up that you can actually kind of think of the original feature film as a different canon, as maybe a parallel universe. So uh, I don't know what the future holds. I think our first choice for most of us uh, on this podcast or listening to this podcast uh, we would love some kind of continuation of the TV universe, right? The the Wright Glasner Cooper universe. Yeah. But uh, I would love to see Stargate continue in some way, shape, or form, even if even if we reach the point where we have to conclude that the the TV universe has has had its time to shine and is over. Uh, I'm I'm theoretically, I suppose, open to another parallel canon that does something else with the idea, right? Just like I I went and saw the J.J. Abrams Kelvin timeline films and enjoyed them for what they were. I think the ultimate question we're facing now, now that Stargate has turned a quarter century old, is what is the long term future of the brand? Um, I think you and I are both such a fan of the device of the Stargate itself and the possibilities of the franchise Yeah. that, well, you know, like you said, if we have to completely ch- uh, close the chapter and move on, it, it might have to be done. You know, there's only so many prequels, Stargate Origins type things you can do. And, you know, you can explore the option for a fourth series in that canon. Um, but ultimately there will be a window because of actors and, and because, you know, Brad Wright's not going to be writing and show running forever and, uh, RDA and Amanda and Michael Shanks and Chris Judge, you know, at some point they're going to retire from acting or, or not want to take these calls. So I- I'm starting to realize like we might, we might get a fourth show, but we also might have to close the chapter and, and seal it for good to move on. Yeah. So we stand at this point now, eight years after SGU went off the air where, uh, I think the franchise is, is in transition, right? We have to, as fans, we have to make some decisions about uh, what kind of Stargate uh, we're willing to love. Uh, I look at what's going on with Star Trek right now, right? With with Discovery and the new series that are being created by Alex Kurtzman and that team. Um, that's, that's not the era of Gene Roddenberry. It's not the era of Rick Berman and Brandon Braga. It's, it's a new set of creators with a new vision, uh, but they're trying to tie that into the existing world, into the existing canon. Uh, maybe Stargate can do something like that in a year or five years or, or God forbid, 10 years. So happy birthday to Stargate. Stargate Universe at 10 years, the Stargate franchise and the feature film at 25 years. Uh, it's really incredible. And it's been just a joy to be along for the ride as a fan. All this month on GateWorld.net, we're celebrating 25 years of Stargate, uh, 10 years of Stargate Universe. Uh, We're posting lots of new content on the franchise's characters, on the themes, the family that is Stargate fandom. Uh, So head over to GateWorld.net and see what we've got going on there. Uh, I hope you subscribe to the podcast. I I hope you find us on our YouTube channel. Leave a comment anywhere you find the show. And uh, we're also jumping on board with the hashtag Stargate25, which Stargate Command has been running with on the official Stargate channel to celebrate a quarter of a century with this universe. So if you want to hear more from us on Stargate Universe, Adam, you've got Sarah coming back on the podcast to talk about season two of Stargate Universe here in the next few weeks. And then it's going to be 2020 before you know it. We're going to be looking ahead to what is next for Stargate. 
Yes, indeed. And, and hopefully, I, you know, I predicted this year something was going to happen. It looks like I'm running out of time. Looks like my prediction might not be accurate, but you know, next year is going to be a fresh start and we're going to wrap up some of the legacy stuff we've done this year and then look to the event horizon and see if anything comes our way. Thanks everybody for listening. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Thanks for all of your comments, all of your feedback and all of your support for GateWorld over the last 20 years of the website. Hopefully we've got another 20 years in us. I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) I'm counting on it. And in the meantime, I'm Darren. And I'm Adam. And we'll catch you again next time on the GateWorld Podcast.